Today's guest is fascinating. He is an author. He's an author of many, many books, but we're actually going to focus in on his latest book, which is called Coaching the Brain. He is the founder of the Neuroscience Coaching Center. As I said, prolific uh, author. He also coaches. But I said, we really focus on this book, Coaching the Brain, because it is a fantastic read. If you want to understand how the brain works and how we can actually really get the most out of our brains. He also dispels some myths that have been around for a long time. In fact, some that I've even quoted myself, and he dispels those myths about, you know, the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain, or, you know, we only use a tiny percentage of our brain, some of those things like that. But we really do get into some great conversations about habits, how you create habits, how you change habits. You don't break habits, you change habits, but also how we can train our brain to become emotionally intelligent and also how we can become more resilient uh, and, and, and happy uh, by really, really leaning in to how we can optimize that wonderful, wonderful thing that we have, which is our brain. So I really do encourage you to sit back and enjoy uh, this discussion. It is great. Love you if you really like it. Love you to go and give us a good review because that's how we reach more people. But in the meantime, sit back and listen to the very, very interesting Joseph O'Connor. Joseph, thank you so much indeed for joining us here on the podcast. It's a real honor to have you here. It's a pleasure, John. Great to be here. Many thanks. I'm looking forward to this. I loved your book, Coaching the Brain. I really did. It, it was uh, fabulous. I mean, from my perspective, doing the sort of work that I do to kind of get the sort of insights that you share are, are, are you know, it's just brilliant. So thank you for writing it. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed writing it. It was it was great fun to write. Actually, now, well, you're you're a fairly prolific writer. Can I can I get get rid of a couple of things that just kind of always kind of crop up, and some of them are myths, and you refer to them. But the difference between the brain and the mind. <laughs> okay, well, I could I could uh, you know you, you can touch a brain, and and it's something that you, that uh, is material, but uh, the mind is not. Uh, the mind is is something else and we have no idea how those two connect i make the the um, metaphor in the book and it's actually on the cover of uh, candle and flame so you have the candle which is material uh, and then the flame which is immaterial and the two go together and you, you can't really have a flame floating in space without something to support it and a candle without a flame is is not really doing its job mm. so um, you need both, and that's what's really amazing, that um, the brain is material, but thoughts and, you know, what we call the mind, made up of our thoughts, is immaterial, and mm. yet the immaterial thoughts fashion the material of the brain, make the connections, make some thoughts easier to think, make other thoughts not so easy to think. Um, it, it, it is fascinating. A couple of myths that you referred to earlier on, um, and I just want to get, get those out of the way. One is, you know, that the left side is rational and the right side is creative. That is a myth, isn't it? Yeah. And I hate, I hate to, and I hated to find out that it's a myth because I've used it a few times. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the brain is just a system, so you're using it's like you're using all of it pretty much all of the time. Now, it's true to say that the um, in most people, uh, I think about 95 percent of the population, um, maybe even a bit more, the linguistic circuits of the brain are in the left hemisphere. That's true. And of course, language tends to be, you know, the rational, logical, etc. Um, but if you're going to be creative in any kind of art whatsoever, you need the whole lot working. And you need the connections between them, you know, the kind of subterranean connections between them working particularly well. So, uh, you know, it's I make the metaphor of there's the, the library with all the books and people reading in silence and the party where everybody's having a good time and, and lots of music and dance. Um, but it, it's not like that. You know, there's there's parties in the library and there's reading in the party. And so the whole lot goes together. Yeah, the other myth that you just about is about that the fact that we only use 
a small percentage of our brain. Um, and I'm just curious, when you, when you think about you know, those things, that small percentage, because you're saying, no, that's not true, and the myth about the left and the right, I mean, where do these come from and what, you know, what substance were there for them to exist in the first place? Well, I think for the left and right hemisphere, um, those two parts of the brain, it's true to say that there are some, you know, there, there are the, the there are logical parts in the left hemisphere and there are, shall we say, the more spatial orientation uh, parts in the right hemisphere. And so there is a certain amount of specialization, but you're actually going to put them together in any sort of reasonable and creative way. They've got to work together. So I don't think it's fair to say one part of the brain is this and the other part of the brain is that. Uh, and it, even worse to say some people are left brained and some people are right brained. I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, the, the myth about, uh, and I, I've read it around, you know, we only use 10% of our brains. Uh, it, you can't say things like that because it's just uncountable seeing as that we have about 86 billion um, <laughs> neurons and, and countless quadrillion connections who's counting i think there's a positive intention in that saying look we don't use our our mental capacity in in the way that we could do we have far greater potential than we ever use and i think that's fair enough yeah okay can i talk about habits because you you do talk about habits in the book and you say that a uh, quote i hope i'm getting it this right habits are our friends when we want to stay the same but when we want to change they become the enemy <laughs> i thought habits were good of course not all habits are good are they? Was... well you know yes habits are essential and good well, that's what we do we spend our time repeating stuff over and over again which then gets translated into the brain connections being strengthened and so that it happens without us having to think about it. We, we couldn't really go through a day if we didn't have habits. We, we cannot think about everything that we do. So that's fine. Um, but, you know, habits can be not just, they're not just physical, of course, they're mental habits as well. The thoughts that we continually think and continually repeat and pay attention to will strengthen the connections in the brain and will become those things that automatically come into the brain. So if you think of habits of things that we do without thinking, then this is a certain danger, isn't it? Because while the environment stays the same, that's fine, works great. But the moment we want to make some change, then that becomes the difficulty. You know, even with the, the really simple habits of, of uh, I don't know, um, I mean, snow, smoking has a, as a chemical component, but just like maybe like a habit, someone's got a habit of kind of, you know, scratching their ear and they want to stop because it doesn't really suit their personality. But because it, it's so ingrained, um, it just keeps happening and they have to be aware of it. And maybe they have to get someone to, to tell them when they're doing it and they have to have reminders. So when we want to change those habits that automatic, we do without thinking, will continue to be automatic and without thinking unless we make a positive effort and then we can change them and it's a, that's a better metaphor than breaking habits because you don't break habits you actually divert the energy in, into another one in the book there's the metaphor of the ski slope you know it's like uh, there's virgin snow going down the hill and then there's one skier goes down and then another skier goes down pretty much the same way because it's easier that the snow is a bit flatter and then by the time 20 or 30 skiers have gone down the same way there's there's the way that people are going to go and that's easy and somebody coming to that will go oh yeah there's the track off we go now if you want to make a new track uh, a new habit in this metaphor you're going to have to break the snow again somewhere else and that takes some effort and, and thought and when you when you're talking about changing that habit where does the where does the brain and willpower coming into play come into play to stay with it um well a habit um from a neuroscience point of view is is um an action from which the reward has been which used to be rewarding but is no longer rewarding in other words we we repeated that action because it was rewarding at one stage but then it just becomes habitual and there isn't really any reward left in it 
Um, so you, you said about the willpower, yes. Willpower, um, you can't find willpower in the brain. Um, what you can find in the brain is just a series of, of electrochemical connections. And the willpower is something that we experience um, uh, as part of our, our, our mind and our, our thinking and, and our subjective experience. So when we want to change a habit, um, first of all, there's got to be a good reason for it. We're not going to change it mm. just at random. And that usually means that the other one wasn't working or that there's no, there isn't a reward in it anymore. Maybe even it's not very good anymore. So we do have a, an, a reason for changing it. And then if we can structure it in some way to make that change, it becomes easy. Now there's good ways and difficult ways to change habits. And if you choose a difficult way to change a habit, then you're gonna need a lot of this uh, willpower, you know, that mm -hmm. we all experience. But um, we don't know where that is in the brain, if anywhere. Right. Can you just to go on and talking about habits, because, um, and, and I thought this was interesting. You say that to change a habit of thinking, you need to act differently. And to a, change a habit of acting, you need to think differently. And I, the reason I found that so particularly interesting was because, you know, I always, I, I kind of get the, I kind of got the bit about to change a habit of acting, you need to think differently because of some of the inside out. But to change a habit of thinking, you need to act differently. And that didn't quite sit as easily with me. Uh, um, <laughs> it's funny to have what you wrote held back to you. So what did I, what did I mean? I, I think that if, if you have a, a habit of thinking, you, uh, for example, um, you, you think that the delegation doesn't work, okay? Um, because you've delegated in the past and it's been a disaster. So you really don't delegate, but um, you're getting a lot of work. There's a lot of stress. You're not sleeping very well. The work, you know, you just don't have time. Big shortage of time, not seeing your family. I've got to do something about this. Delegation doesn't work. I wish it did. Now delegation doesn't work is a, is a thought, what I call a mental model. It's, um, it's a habit of thinking that you take for granted built on previous experience because we're not arguing with the fact that it was a disaster before but what a coach would say and certainly what I would say would be something like okay let's take a look at that particular context that particular time those particular people and the sort of person that you were and how you did it where it didn't work but we know that didn't work but we make it very contextual and of course it's in the past now different time we're in the, we're now we want to see if this is still true for you in order to find that out you have to do something differently in other words you would have to delegate something you'd have to act and do it in a way of course that didn't replicate the mistake in the past and then you would get real uh, real world information about what you did and well, how well that worked or not but as long as you don't actually make the experiment, you're not going to find anything because, you know, yeah. thoughts are just thoughts. You know, you can replace any of them, but you've got to try them out to see what works. So does the, the, the actions, what you're saying, the actions kind of validates the thought. Well, is that right? I, I, my, my context here was if you have uh, some uh, habit of thinking, some mental model that is limiting your, your courses of action. And but that mental model is a habit. So you, you kind of keep doing it. And there's always a little bit of fear as well. You know, it didn't work in the past. It was awful. I don't want to do it again. So, uh, you know, you're a little bit afraid here and you're afraid that if you try it out, there's going to be some repercussion and that's going to make it bad. So you have to do it differently. Perhaps that sentence ought to be uh, uh, slightly modified in the second edition to say something like <laughs> uh, if you want to change a, a habit of thought then you have to um, test it out with a different action to the one that gave you the original experience <laughs> but that's a bit of a mouthful isn't it <laughs> <laughs> i prefer your version <laughs> <laughs> it made you think so that that's the point isn't it that's the whole point about it but it it, it also just to go back to to something else you said i say the thought the thoughts we entertain on a regular basis 
go from being our guests to our lodgers to perhaps eventually our masters. Um, which is which is is kind of touching on the point that you're making is if I have this thought about something, then it becomes what I believe and it becomes then how how I behave. That's fine, and we all know that. But how do you, if it is a thought that uh, we entertain on a regular basis, I mean, if it's serving us well, that's great, right? But if it's not serving us well, it's obviously not so great. But it's very easy to say, well, change, stop, stop entertaining the thought that it's not serving you well. But that's easier said than done, isn't it? Well, yeah, but that's only half the story, isn't it? You can't, you can't just stop it. You have to replace it with something something that is better suited to you, who, who you are now, your life, your context, your goals, your values. So you, you take the original intention of the thought, uh, which was probably pretty good, you know, maybe it mm -hmm. saved you, uh, kept you safe, saved you some trouble, um, did well for itself, you know, honor that. Um, so respect the intention, but um, replace it with something that still honors the intention but is more accurate to the person who you are now and, and the surroundings and context that you have now. Mm -hmm. So it's replacing it, isn't it? It's not Absolutely, yeah. You, you've got to, you can't just stop it. You, know, you, you want to go skiing, so, you know, you've got to find another way down. Uh, but yeah. these, I mean, these habits, the, the point you made was a, was a very good one because we, we're forming, kind of forming habits all the time. And some of the saddest uh, one of the saddest phrases that uh, I've heard people say, and even myself say, is uh, one more time won't hurt. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, one more time won't hurt, but one more time won't hurt repeated <laughs> all mm. the time as a justification is going to hurt a lot. Mm. Um, and that's a problem. And, and the second thing is that habits are formed by repetition, for sure. Um, but they're also formed and they're formed much quickly by attention, what you pay attention to. So it's very important to, to think about what you are actually paying attention to, because attention is, is a, a very precious resource, I, I think, anyway. It's, again, it's not one of these things like willpower, you know, willpower and attention, you don't find them in the brain, but um, we find them in our subjective experience. And whatever you're paying attention to is actually um, turbocharging the, uh, the rate of connections that are, that are being made in the brain. A uh, simple example, uh, uh, for many years, I was a professional guitarist and I used to practice the guitar, of course. But I, and I knew that if I practiced for half an hour a day, really paying attention to what I did, this was worth a couple of hours just messing around. Mm -hmm intentional uh, is, is is it true then to say just as you were talking it, it was just occurring to me you know you, you talk to people who um you know who, who become depressed and actually one of the things that I, I always find interesting and interesting for me but disturbing for them is 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 that when you actually hear them talk they, they said they get fixated about something something is and they go around and they go around and they go around and they the thought just does not leave. They they cannot, well, I know you can't stop the thought, but they can't replace it even with something else. And that actually just spirals in, into depression. Is that a significant reason why people spiral in that way? It tends to happen in depression, yes. It tends to get this rumination of, of uh, it's always the bad thoughts. <laughs> so no, yeah. we don't ruminate on good thoughts, no. which is a shame, isn't it? Um, you know, something comes in of something that might happen hasn't happened, might happen. And then, oh, well, if that happens, that would be that, and then that would be that, and then and then it spirals off, as you say, into, oh my God, and, and in your head, before you know it, um, you've lost your house and, and you know your mm. income and, and you're on the street. And none of it is true. Uh, and yet it, it's somehow very seductive to fall into those kind of loops. So um, this is where, it is important, and there's many ways that you can go about um, putting a stop to this. And the sooner you do it, the, the easier it is. And, and of course, the more you do it, the easier it gets because you're building that uh, habit of, of stopping it at the beginning. Um, so first of all, you can think, you know, that kind of rumination is, 
perhaps in, in technical language, you could call it your default mode network. The default mode network is the one the part in the brain that kind of, you know, go round and round and it's all about me. If you go round and round, it's all about me in a nice way. This is the daydream and that's all very nice. But if it goes round and round all about me uh, in a bad way, then this is the nightmare. So first thing is, oh, my default mode network is, uh, is, is playing up again, you know. So it's, it's immediately then you've taken a new perspective on it. It's like, it's not kind of you in a sense. It's a circuit somewhere that's yeah. misbehaving. Huh? Uh, and then there, there's many steps that you can take from that, which is um, none of this is true, of course. Uh, what else can I think about? Hmm. so and it's that, almost creating that, that distance giving. isn't it yeah you've yeah. got to create the distance first it's not me you know this isn't true and i can certainly and you can change thinking there's a there's a strange seduction in those think those thoughts which is you know that it's definitely there um otherwise but at the same time it is possible to change otherwise it would be you know predestination you'd be spiraling down and there would be nothing you could do about it but that, that's not our experience. Our experience is that this, this thought seems to be have a strength of its own. Yeah. But then we can remember, first of all, there's a distance from it. It's, it's a thought and it's not me because the, the me that chooses differently has a variety of, of thoughts to choose from. And that's just one of them. So if you can take that step back and then see it as as something else it helps you to separate right from the start yeah fascinating just shifting gear a little bit just in terms of how how do we train our brain to become emotionally intelligent <laughs> oh um reminds me of train your dragon i don't i don't <laughs> know if you can train your brain really um Emotional intelligence is something that that you can get better at, as it were. I mean, we're all emotionally intelligent insofar as we don't uh, break down in, in anger or, or rage or sadness or, or um, fear all the time. And um, we're able to manage our moods to some extent. And we can get better at that with practice. Uh, first of all, by being aware of those emotions. And then secondly, by having a series of strategies in order to um, direct the energy of them. Because I don't think you control emotions. Emotions, all for me, all emotions are good. You know, they have an energy to them that's there for a purpose. And uh, some of them can save your life. And that's why they're there in evolutionary terms, you know, especially the, the unpleasant ones, you know, the fear and the anxiety, the, the, uh, the sadness, the disgust, the ones we don't like to feel are the ones that can save your life. The ones that we do like to feel like happiness are a bit of an evolutionary luxury. You know, they don't actually contribute necessarily to you surviving, but they're very nice to have. So it's about the awareness there, the, then the ability to, 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 again, to just create a little bit of space and to think about where do I want this energy to go, right? I, I want it, um, I don't want it to overwhelm myself or, or another person. So how can I direct it? And then how can I deal with the aftermath? So it's- and what, are the, yeah, and, how, and what are the things, sorry, Joseph, what are the things that we can, that we can do? You're, you're saying, I don't know, are you saying we can't train, but we can't develop our brain? Is that, that's, we can't develop our brain, is that correct? Training, uh, just, the, just the word train, really, it, it's, it implies something that, that you keep doing over and over again, and then it works perfectly, and, and I'm not sure that that's right. the right model. Um, but for, for emotions, for me, emotions, you, you're asking about, um, no, I, sorry, I've lost the, the point of your question. Well, no, it was just in terms of how we develop our brains. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, how we develop our brains and what are the things we can do that, that will develop our brains. Okay, well, I mean, the, to de when we say develop our brains, I guess we mean I want to be more emotionally intelligent. I want to be have better focus, better attention, mm. uh, all of those things that we feel in our awareness and subjective experience 
that have a basis, you know, in our skull of the, all the electrical signals. But it's also important to remember that <clears throat> the brain is part of the body. You know? Brains don't work without a body. Uh, they're embodied and they're also a social organ. So it's important to remember that in order to, you know, quote, develop your brain, um, you need to engage with other people. You need that external feedback because without external feedback, the, the brain will just, you know, go round and round in its circular glittering maze of corridors and not get you anywhere. Um, so you do need to engage with other people. And secondly, you need to take care of it. And taking care of it means, uh, in physical terms, two things. One is getting enough uh, quality and quantity of sleep, which is really, really important for the brain. It's the best thing you can do for the brain. And secondly, to get to physically exercise, because physical exercise, again, develops the whole body, the blood vessels, the vascular system, and the brain's got that and it needs it. So. You, you've, got to, you've got to appreciate that your brain is not a kind of logic machine on a stick, that you can ignore the rest of your body and just get better at, at, at thinking, because that's not going to work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it may get you better at thinking, but you probably won't have any friends and you'll, <laughs> and you'll feel bad. <laughs> so how, how, do you, how do you become then, just to, to as you say, well-stressed and resilient rather mm -hmm. than distressed and unhappy? Um, well, uh, apart from, you know, treating yourself well in terms of, of sleep and, and exercise and lifestyle and, and those sort of things, um, a stress is basically something that seems to be, be beyond your capabilities uh, and is usually uh, continuing on you. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that the, the circuits in the brain start to, um, running and this leads to a, a production of cortisol uh, from the adrenal glands. Now what cortisol is, is it's called a stress hormone and it's got a bit of a bad reputation, but you really need cortisol. It, it wakes you up in the morning, it keeps you alert during the day, and then it dies down at night. That's natural. But if you are continually put under challenges, especially if you feel you have no control at all over the challenges that you're forced to meet, then that cortisol is ramped up all the time. And when that happens, that then leads to, as we know, you don't sleep well, digestive upsets, immune system doesn't work so well. Uh, all, of, all of those are the results of excess chronic cortisol, not just cortisol. And that's what we call stress. So um, it's about being able to balance the challenges that we put ourselves through and the resources that we have because if you have plenty of resources and no challenge you know it's like well <laughs> life's life's fine you're you're well within your comfort zone um but you're not likely to to get anywhere much beyond that so you know fine a quiet life um if you're too much challenge and not enough resource then that's the stress uh, so we want to balance those two and we want to be able to, as far as possible, put ourselves in a situation where we have some kind of control over that balance. Can I ask you one thing is that, that, that I, I was curious about reading the book was that you say that the brain works as a prediction machine. Ah, yes. Can you maybe elaborate on that and what do you mean? What, and we, what's it predicting? <laughs> it's predicting everything. Um, <clears throat> the way it works, I think, is that... Um, as human beings, we, we need some kind of certainty. A random world is just intolerable. You know, if you didn't know what was gonna be outside your door or how people would respond to you, this would be highly stressful because you'd be continually challenged. You wouldn't have any control at all. It would be changing all the time. So it's very important for us that we're able to form some mental models, uh, some uh, expectations, if you like, predictions about how the world works. And we start learning these from day one, uh, when we're born, there's the world. And we're constantly having experience in the world and, and uh, our parents and people who care for us, that 
build up a series of ideas in our mind about this is how this is the sort of person I am. Mm -hmm. uh, other people are like this, and this is how the world works. And these, you know, they become habits, and that's fantastic. We really need those. So that when you come across a situation which uh, which you're not really very familiar with, you can you have at least something to, to be built on. Your brain's saying, this is what's happened. Then you can test it. Does it happen that time? If it doesn't, then you can update your mental model. Yeah? You can update your prediction so that you have that extra bit of experience, that extra bit of knowledge, so that when you come to a similar situation again, you're that better you've been you know you've had your software updated as it were uh, and you're better to meet it so you could say that the, the brain predicts the future based on our experiences in the past and has the ability to learn from our experiences in the present in order to make better predictions in the future and the better predictions you make the more confident and the more successful that you'll be does that mean that that or is that assuming that you are learning from your experiences? Oh, yeah. If you are, <laughs> if you are not learning from your experiences, then it's just going to predict what it always predicted. Yeah, well, learning means change, doesn't it? We're mm. maybe back to the thing about uh, if you if you want to change your thinking, you've got to act on it. You you've got to do something different. So yes, you know you, you've heard the thing about someone who who has the same year, same years experience for twenty years. Yeah, and someone mm. who has 20 years experience in 20 years. Mm. So again, it's about challenge, you know, putting yourself in new situations, looking for the gaps, looking for things that you have the resources, you feel your resources, but a little bit stretch you, a little bit stretch you, learn, update the, the predictions, puts you, makes you able to get into the bigger game, as it were, you know, the, the wider game, the game that has better rewards in it, the, the game that is that, that little bit harder to play. Fascinating. Joseph, I could keep going on, but I've already kept you for longer than I said I would. <laughs> Me but this, too, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> this, this has been fantastic, I, I, and I love it. And I would really do recommend to, to anybody listening to really go and, and, and buy your book. It is so thought-provoking. It really is. I found it, I found a great treasure trove. And it's one of these books that I, I know that I'll just have close by me and dig into because it is fantastic. But before we wrap up, two questions I ask everybody. One is a book. And I know that you're an author of 20 books, so it seems almost unfair to ask you this, but I am nevertheless going to do so. A book that has had an impact upon you? Well, yeah, what's the book and what was the impact? Oh, okay, well, I'm not going to choose one of mine, uh, that's for sure. Um, and I'm starting, uh, I've written, uh, all the books that I've written are, are non-fiction, um, but I've started to write fiction. I've always been fascinated by science fiction. And uh, a book, if I was to pick out one that really I remember, uh, is um, the, uh, it's by Dan Simmons, and it's called the Hyperion, uh, Hyperion Saga. I think there's three books in it. And it is a brilliant, um, endless stream of creative and wonderful writing about fascinating things in the future. Um, that, that for me, um, it's just, wow, if, if I can be as creative as that and be able to put that to communicate that in such a way as that, I would be very happy. Oh, that's great. That's, I, I love getting new ones. That's a new one to my list that I haven't come across before. We were talking about habits earlier on. Um, and the, the other question I ask everybody is a daily habits, daily rituals, things that you do on a regular basis that serve you. Oh, well, it's got to be uh, meditation practice uh, immediately after I get up. Um, and, you know, referring to the neuroscience, although they may seem poles apart, there is rock solid uh, research uh, in neuroscience that meditation is one of the best things that you can do for your brain. I mean, it really mm -hmm. does a lot in terms of forming certain connections. Um, and again, allowing you to take that distance from your experience that you need. So, yeah, I, I meditate for half an hour every morning. I'm just curious about the meditation because I, I would be an advocate of, of, of meditating myself, but I, I would always 
refer to myself as a poor meditator um, because I get I get distracted uh, easily. But nevertheless, I, I do try. You can't For fail. You, you can't fail. At well, I know, I know. That's what I, I, People who I really know a lot about always say, give me the same answer to do that. When you're meditating, just out of curiosity, do you have a do you, do you have a guided meditation, or do you just sit in silence? Do you count? Do you have a mantra, or what way does it work for you? Usually, just in silence and uh, and watch the thoughts. That's why you can't fail. Some days it's it's very peaceful. Uh, it's a bit you know it's a bit like sitting at the at a train station. Um, the thoughts, the trains of thought, they go by. And that's an interesting one. That's an interesting one. And usually you'd be jumping on these and you'd be riding them in all sorts of directions. But when you're meditating, you just watch them. And, you know, sometimes it's Clapham Junction. Hmm. And you find yourself, you suddenly find yourself in, you know, uh, Watford Junction. You think, how did I get there? Yeah. Back, got to go back to Clapham Junction. Back and watch them go through. So, um, you know, a successful meditation is not all wonderful and, and peaceful uh you you can't fail you you just watch the thoughts mm. and and see what happens yeah, fascinating thank you for that joseph this has been a real pleasure thank you so much for, for coming along it's been fantastic so informative and i said uh where can people reach you where can they get in contact with you where can they get the book uh well certainly get the book from amazon um yeah. my web website coachingthebrain.com is a good place to start and uh, I'm on social media, LinkedIn and Facebook. Great. So okay. Well, happy. we'll put all of that in the notes. Joseph, thank you again. It's been a real pleasure. Okay. Thank you, John. It's great.